happy to be with you and to have a, again a part in this uh, program. We love and appreciate the congregation here and of course uh, have had a long association and friendship, comradeship with Brother uh, Gary Summers and Sister Barbara Summers. We have appreciated them, uh, in fact, uh, long before I met them. Uh, met him, especially him, I knew about him, uh, through the annual Denton lectures. And then uh, finally got to meet him back in 1996. We've been friends ever since. And uh, he stands for the truth, loves the truth, but he also does so, as Brother Rex Turner would say, with a balance wheel. Uh, he doesn't wobble one way or the other, but he stays straight and true. We appreciate that. Also appreciate the fine lesson that was just presented by this young man, uh, Brother Mylan. I've heard him previously, and uh, he always does a superb job. We appreciate the material, the study that he just laid out for us concerning the prophecies relative to the church. And, uh, and really, to a certain extent, he's already preached much of my lesson. If you look at my manuscript, uh, I go into some details concerning the conflict that we have relative to the kingdom and the church uh, in the face of premillennialism. You have uh, the false doctrines of uh, premillennialism known as historical, uh, dispensational, and cultic premillennialism, three basic groups that you can divide it into. As far as premillennialism itself, it basically holds that Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth, literally, and is going to set foot on the earth and set up a thousand year reign in the city of Jerusalem and will sit upon the literal throne of David. That he will restore the Jewish uh, system, the temple system and worship and all aspects of that. They take a literal approach uh, to the interpretation of all prophecy virtually. Uh, what is fascinating is to watch them when they get into certain texts that obviously involve figures of speech that suddenly it's no longer literal. And uh, they will switch gears. And so they pick and choose what they want to take literally and uh, what, they, uh, what won't fit their literal scheme. They will then spiritualize or come up with some way to manipulate the text. Uh, this is... Uh, a uh, reverse approach to what we have seen, and we've discussed from this pulpit, the AD 70 heresy, where they take every text, every prophecy, and spiritualize it until they come across a text that if you try to spiritualize it, it obviously sounds so absurd, then suddenly it's literal. And so they wind up with half of Zechariah 14 literal and half of it spiritual. And they switch on a dime as it suits them. That's just the way they are. The inconsistency in their hermeneutics uh, is amazing. Same thing with premillennialism. Now Jesus had taught his disciples that they were to pray for the coming kingdom. They were to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That was part of his teaching, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter six. And uh, they were to keep in mind that uh, the kingdom was then future. In fact, Jesus went around and he and his disciples, just as John the baptizer did, preaching uh, that the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand. I'll say more about that in just a moment. But the premillennialist says, no, it's off, way off in the future and it's going to be the thousand year reign and uh, a literal reign here on earth. By the way, I always like Brother Foy Wallace's definition of premillennialism, Foy Jr. He, he said pre means before, millennial means a thousand years, and ism means there ain't no such thing. 
And so, and, and uh, he spent much of his life refuting that error. One of the first books that I uh, imbibed and cut my teeth on upon obeying the gospel back around the age of 18 was Brother Wallace's book, uh, God's Prophetic Word. Tremendous book, great book. I don't know if it's still in print, but it ought to be. Brethren, we need books like that, tremendous material and study. And uh, I came out of a dispensational premillennial denomination. And uh, that uh, doctrine of premillennialism is one of the things that probably three-fourths of the lessons that are preached from their pulpits concern that doctrine. Three-fourths. Now, in the manuscript, you'll see a discussion of the difference between historical and dispensational and cultic premillennialism. But I've given you the basic structure that's common to all three, generally speaking. The, uh, uh, what I wish to get to uh, right now is the fact that the Bible, of course, is what provides the true answer as to the nature of the kingdom and the church and their relationship to one another. Keep in mind that the Bible teaches in Matthew chapter 4 verse 4 that uh, we're to live, we're to live not by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And uh, Jesus says of that, in his response to Satan, he says, It stands written, Thou shalt live by, shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It stands written. That's the force of the, of the perfect tense. It was true when it was written. It was true when Jesus said it. And it stands true even today. That's the force of the text. And then... Peter says in 1 Peter 4 verse 11, If any man speak, let him speak as what? The oracles of God. Paul himself warns of uh, adding to God's word, uh, preaching a gospel different from that which Christ and his apostles brought. Galatians 1 verses 6 and following. John admonishes against adding to or taking from the Word of God, Revelation 22, 18, and 19, and many other pa passages can be appealed to to this very end. In the words of the Old Testament prophet, Isaiah, to the law and to the testimony, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this Word, there is no light in them. And so we need to pay attention to what the Bible says on the subject of the kingdom and the church. There is, in premillennialism, a view that separates the two, depending on the group you're dealing with. In premillennialism, the kingdom was offered to the Jews, rejected by them by their rejection of Christ, and so it was postponed. This view is held by both those who teach historic premillennialism, the older form, and dispensational premillennialism, which actually began in the 1820s among the Plymouth Brethren. And, uh, but both groups hold to that particular view, the postponement theory. That view also influenced R.H. Bowl and his followers, Charles M. Neal, for example, uh, tried to defend that view in his debates with Brother Foy Wallace. And uh, Brother Wallace did a great job refuting that error. So if you can get the uh, Wallace, the Neil Wallace debate, would be a great book to have as a reference toward that end. But getting back to the key point, they try to make a distinction. And so the kingdom was postponed. And in the place of the kingdom being postponed, 
God then came up with this idea of the church, which was a complete and total mystery, never was revealed in the Old Testament in any shape, form, or fashion, according to the premillennialist, and uh, it was not made known in any fashion, and God set it up to fill in, to fill the gap until such a time as the Jews would accept the, the kingdom and accept Christ. Well, part of the problem is that uh, given premillennial thought, God didn't see the Jews rejecting the kingdom to start with. Well, if he didn't see them rejecting the kingdom to start with when they did it the first time, well, who's to say they're not going to do it again and again and again and just keep on doing it? At what point are they going to suddenly uh, accept the kingdom and what is God going to fill the gap with every time they reject it? Continue to fill it with the church? I mean, the, the entire idea calls into question the omniscience of God as well as his wisdom in dealing with the Jewish people and dealing with uh, the church as well. That this is just, it also accuses God of making a mistake. He messed up. Here God lays out this wonderful plan to give the kingdom to the Jews and the Jews reject it. And suddenly God's got to come up with something else because he did not anticipate the Jews rejecting the kingdom. So he had to put together a makeshift, uh, fill-in institution to just bide the time until such time as the Jews would accept the gospel. That's just pure nonsense. That doesn't even make, as Brother uh, Wayne Coates used to say, that doesn't even make good nonsense. So, the kingdom, according to premillennialism, is different from the church. Now, there are some dispensationalists who will make a distinction between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. They will say that the kingdom of God now exists on earth in some measure, and the church is part of it, but not necessarily identical to it. Note that difference. God now has his kingdom over the earth. It's the kingdom of God. But in the millennium, the thousand year reign, that's part of their theory, part of their uh, eschatology, you have the kingdom of heaven. And so the kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven are two different institutions, depending on who you're talking with. But if you examine the Gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, particularly Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you will note that the kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are used interchangeably, especially when it comes to the parables. Take, for example, the use of uh, the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13 clearly applies it to the kingdom of heaven, verse 11. You go over to Mark chapter 4 verse 11 and Luke chapter 8 verse 10 and it uses the phrase the kingdom of God. And it's talking about the mysteries of each. And by the way, the, this idea of the church being a mystery, uh, they'll, they'll say, well, the church is a, was a mystery in the sense that it was never spoken of in the Old Testament. Hogwash. The word musterian does not mean mystery in the sense of absolutely unknown. It simply stresses the idea that this was something that God had not fully, completely revealed every aspect of it. And so in the Old Testament, it was a mystery. It was something for them to contemplate, to think about, to meditate on, to try to come to a better understanding of it. It was not fully revealed. In fact, Paul makes that point in Ephesians chapter 3. He says that he wrote a four of that mystery in few words, whereby when you read, that is, when you read what I've written, he's telling the Ephesian brethren, ye may understand my knowledge of the mystery. He's talking about the mystery of the gospel and thus of the church. 
And that mystery was how both Jew and Gentile would be made one in Christ. That's Ephesians 3, verses 4 through 6. And this according to the eternal purpose, that's going all the way back into eternity, that God had planned in, in uh, Christ by the church. And the church has an eternal purpose. And so uh, you go on from verse 11 right on down through the end of chapter 3. He stresses that eternal purpose. And so that mystery was simply not revealed to the extent, he says, as it is now being made known by us, that is, by the apostles and prophets of the New Testament era. The point being this, it was not a case that nothing was ever revealed concerning that mystery, concerning the church in the Old Testament, but rather it was not simply revealed to the extent or in the same manner or to the same degree as it is now revealed in the New Testament. We have the fuller, complete revelation. That's the nature of the New Testament system. That's why it is called the perfect, the complete law of liberty. James 1 verse 25. It brings the full revelation of these things to light. And when we come over to the New Testament we find that the kingdom and the church in many respects are spoken of synonymously. That's not to say that there aren't texts that use the kingdom in a slightly different sense. We'll talk about that as time permits. The kingdom, as contemplated in Old Testament prophecy, and the church are in effect and in, very, in a very real sense, one and the same. In fact, in Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19, Jesus uses them interchangeably. You'll recall that upon the good confession that uh, Peter made, that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, Matthew 16, 16, Jesus then responded, uh, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, Simon son of Jonas, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, Petros, a stone, a small stone. And upon this rock, Petra, a large bedrock foundation, large rock, I will build my church. Notice, I will build. It was yet future relative to the time frame in which Jesus is speaking. That implies John hadn't built it. John the baptizer had not built the church. Jesus was going to build it, and it was still future. In fact, when it would come, John would be dead. And the head of the church, of course, is Jesus Christ. He's the head of the church, not the John the Baptist. In fact, John lost his head. He had his head cut off. But Jesus is the one who would build the church. He says, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. There are two senses in which that's true. One being that Jesus' resurrection was going to occur and uh, that would allow him to complete his mission of building the church. The, uh, the Hadean realm would not hold him. Death would not keep him in its power. But he would arise from the dead out of the uh, grave and thus his spirit brought back, his soul brought back from the Hadean realm of Abraham's bosom, which is part of that realm, uh, rejoined to his body, which had seen no corruption, he would be raised to sit on David's throne. That specifically is the force of the prophecy in Psalm uh, 16, verses 8 through 10. And Peter goes on to say that this same Jesus has been raised up and is now seated uh, at the right hand of God. What's he saying? The prophecy's been fulfilled. He was raised up to sit. That was the purpose of his being raised. He is now sitting, and he's sitting at the right hand of God. And he is sitting on his Father's throne, according to Revelation 3, 20 and 21. By the way, in the Old Testament, spiritually speaking, David's throne was equated with the throne of God. When Solomon sat upon the throne of David, 1 Kings 2 verse 12, he is also said to be seated upon the throne of Jehovah God. 
First Chronicles 29, 23. And so he sat down on the Father's throne, on God's throne. And uh, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. And as a result, is reigning upon the throne of David. He has that throne. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, our brother referred to that uh, passage and uh, has some great material in the book as well. Uh, The uh, Messiah would uh, reign upon his throne while David was dead. Premillennialism teaches that, and this is true whether you believe in a uh, pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, or post-tribulation rapture. You know, they debate them among themselves whether it's going to be pre, mid, or post. They claim there's going to be a seven-year period of tribulation just before this thousand-year reign. And that uh, at that particular point in time, uh, uh, Jesus comes back to set up the kingdom after that uh, seven-year tribulation. But meanwhile, you have a three, uh, a, a uh, rapture, a sneaking out, a snatching up of individuals quietly, secretly, out of uh, uh, the uh, earth uh, who comprise the church. These people will just suddenly disappear and no one will know why. Jesus just slips in, sneaks them out. Well, they debate among themselves, is that supposed to be before the the, the seven year tribulation? And most of them hold that view. Some of them hold to a mid tribulation, three and a half year period. And then others uh, reject it entirely on that end of it and say it occurs just before the second coming and uh, is a post tribulation rapture. And so you have just a brief period and then suddenly Jesus comes back uh, visibly the final time. Three different views. But in all of them, all of them, as a rule, David is still dead. David is still dead, according to the Bible. The premillennialists, however, have David alive when the kingdom comes. That's not what was prophesied by Nathan. Nathan's prophecy says, when thou shalt sleep. And the Hebrew presents it as a, as a situation that is ongoing at the time that the Messiah reigns. That's a problem. You know, on the day of Pentecost, as was pointed out by Milo, Peter said that uh, the patriarch David uh, is uh, dead and buried and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. He said, you can go take a look, see where he's buried. David was still dead, and Jesus was reigning. That's the point, and that's what was prophesied of. The premillennialist has David raised, whether it's uh, at the beginning of the tribulation, whether it's in the middle of the tribulation, or at the very end of the tribulation, they have him raised before Jesus begins to reign. That's not what was prophesied of in 2 Samuel 7, 12 and following. And so that passage destroys premillennialism as the old preachers used to say, world without end. Just defeats it. Knocks it in the head, buries it, and it's dead and buried and it's not going to rise from the dead. And so David has, uh, that, that prophecy has been fulfilled. Jesus has the throne of David. And the Old Testament prophesied of that. Further, the Old Testament prophesied in Zechariah 6, 12, and 13 that Jesus would be king and priest at the same time on his throne and the council of peace would be between them both. You see, under the Old Testament system, he could not be a king and priest at the same time because the priesthood belonged to the tribe of Levi, Jesus from the tribe of Judah. 
The Hebrews writer even makes that point in Hebrews chapter uh, 7, verses 14 and following. And his priesthood is an everlasting, eternal priesthood that passes not to another. If you read the marginal in verses 24 and 25. In chapter, fact, chapter 8, verse 1 through 4 says, If he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer sacrifices according to the law. So he couldn't be priest under the Old Testament system. There can't even be a resurrection of the Old Testament system in Judaic worship with Jesus as king because that would nullify his priesthood. And if you nullify his priesthood, you nullify his kingship because he was to be king and priest at the same time. The point being that if he is priest now, then he must be king now. When he became the high priest, and by the way, he did that when he offered the atonement and sat down on the right hand of God, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, verse 2 and 3, then uh, he also sat down and became king. It's no wonder that on the day of Pentecost, the uh, climax to Peter's sermon is found in verse 36. He says, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that this same Jesus whom ye crucified, God hath made him both Lord, Corios, ruler, master, owner of all things. All things were created by him and for him. Colossians 1 verses 15 and 16. He's the Lord of glory. Both Lord and Christ, Christos, the Messiah. Messias, and as a rule, as a result, is reigning at the right hand of God. He is the anointed prophet, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. He is the anointed priest, Hebrews 8, 1 through 6. And he is the anointed king, Acts 17, verse 7. Acts 17. Uh, Revelation 17, 14. And by the way, he is king of kings and lord of lords. I've had some premillennials say, oh, he's king now, but huh, it's, it's only a mediatorial reign and he's very limited in his power. And No, he's the king of kings and lord of lords right now. He already, in fact, he says in Revelation chapter 2 that he has his iron rod rule over the nation. And he's going to share that with us in eternity. So Revelation, in fact, it'd be a good study to show the book of Revelation destroys premillennialism just as it also destroys hyperpreterism or ultrapreterism. Both, book, both of, of those false systems are refuted by the book that they claim best represents their doctrine. And you can show it from that, from that book. But the kingdom and the church are one and the same for all intents and purposes. In fact, those when we come from the day of Pentecost, just think about it. On the day of Pentecost, where were those who were saved added? Acts 2 verse 47. They were added to the church. You mean God messed up? They were supposed to be in the kingdom according to the new birth. Did the Lord mess up? No, he put them exactly where they were supposed to be because the kingdom and the church are one and the same in that regard. When you're born again, born from above, when you're born of water and of the Spirit, you enter into the kingdom of God. John 3, 5. Well, those who were born again on the day of Pentecost, those who gladly received his word and were baptized, Acts 2, verse 41, were added to the church, verse 47. And it is from that day forward the church is spoken of as an existent reality and all members of that church are also spoken as members of the kingdom, as citizens of the kingdom. Revelation 1.9 being a case in point, many other passages. In fact, if you look at the manuscript, there is passage after passage after passage that does so. Now there is a sense, a heightened sense, in which the ultimate state of the church is referred to as the kingdom. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, verse 18, 
you have Paul using it that way, and he is speaking of it in the future. Ephesians 5, 5 again, 2 Peter 1, verse 11, other passage. But the point being, as far as God's rule, and, that, and the word kingdom simply indicates the nature of the government of the church, the system under which we exist as the church, the body of Christ. The church, my friend, brothers and sisters in Christ, is not a democracy. It is a monarchy. And we are under the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who is also the chief leader, the archegos of the church. Thank you.